So uh, today uh, we have a special uh, guest speaker, David Pagel, who is an associate professor of art at the Claremont Graduate University. David writes regularly for the Los Angeles Times, uh, and he has written catalogs for many, many exhibits and curated these exhibits, and I will tell you about them in a few minutes. Um, first, I'd like you to know that he got his BA um, in Modern Thought and Literature from Stanford University um, in 1985, and his MA in Art History from Harvard University in 1987. His recent curatorial activities include um, Damaged Romanticism, a Mirror of Modern Emotion with Terry Sultan. And he did another uh, project called Electric Mud for the Blaffer Gallery and also at the University um, of Houston. Another, uh, LA Now at the Las Vegas Art Museum. And another, Underground Pop at the Parrish Art Museum in Southampton, New York, where he is an adjunct curator. So that means you moonlight there and do shows from time to time. Yeah. The uh, 10 artists, this particular exhibit was a 10 artist um, project and it focused on the links between pop and folk art in, in works that turn, turn away from the increasingly homogenized character of global culture. Uh, another project he curated was Softcore Hard Edge at the Art Gallery of Calgary, co-curated with Marianne Elder. And this was an 18 artist exhibition uh, on the legacy of California hard edge abstraction. Uh, also, last spring, I had the pleasure and the privilege of going to his exhibit, um, Stone Gravy, in New York City. Um, that was at the uh, Ameringer Macarnini uh, Yohe, I'm not sure if I've said that right, gallery. And it was a very lively event, I have to say, art openings in um, uh, and exhibits on opening night in Manhattan are always a lot of fun. And this one was pretty exciting. I enjoyed it. And I spent a lot of time just photographing everybody. Um, they, the people who were there were as interesting as the art on the walls, I thought. <laughs> um, all right. Now, uh, his recent publications include Fast Time, Slow Looks um, uh, in 2010, The Handmade Imagination of John Frame, uh, and uh, that was published for Three Fragments of a Lost Tale for the Huntington Library Art Collections in Botanical Gardens. Um, he also has published Unassuming and Nutty uh, in uh, the uh, Dion Johnson New Paintings uh, from the Rebecca Ibel Gallery in Columbus, Ohio. Also Cool Compassion, Stephen Creekwee's Pop Pathos, um, and that was for a retrospective memorial for the University of California, Irvine. And his lecture today is titled, Making the World Safe for Me, My Job as a Critic. Please join me in welcoming David Pagel. So my, um, my talk today falls into two parts. The first half, I'm going to tell you what I think I do as a critic. And the second half is I'm going to show you what I've done as a critic and leave it up to you guys to make up your mind if the two halves fit together. Um, at all. Um, I titled the talk Making the World Safe for Me because that's basically what I do as a newspaper critic. Um, I write about art um, because I want to find out what I think about art. The work that I'm drawn to is all contemporary work and the work that has the uh, a lasting impact on me is work that confuses me. If I go into a show, so my job is to run around the galleries in Los Angeles, um, look at lots of stuff, um, and at once a month choose four shows for my, my gallery column. If I'm, the, the things I'm least interested in are things that I understand immediately. If I look at the work and I can think, oh, this artist is, one part X, two parts Y, and three parts Z, and I see how all the parts fit together, I usually um, pretty quickly lose interest in it. What I want is um, I want to see stuff that I don't understand, that I'm um, bothered by, confused by, intrigued by, drawn to, and that kind of like gnawing, staying power of it is the work that I'll, that I'll go for. So 
part of my goal is to figure out what I think about it. And, I, and for me, writing is a great exercise to do that. It will drive me crazy going into a show and have the dealer um, scurry over immediately and say, oh, breathlessly, what do you think? And I, my, what I want to say, what I say in my mind is, like, I have no idea what I think because you're distracting me from the, the show. <laughs> and I'm not so brilliant that I can figure things out in a split second. I actually have to, to mull it over. Um, and besides, I'm deeply offended that um, they then usually after they ask you that, they start to, to tell you everything about the show. And that bugs me because that's, that to me, that's the, the dealer letting me know that he doesn't trust me to do my own job. And even worse than that, he doesn't trust the art that he's put in his space to do its job. But he wants to be the intermediary to, to do that. And, I, um, and, and anyway, um, and then it's in that process of, of me figuring out what I think, which usually takes quite a bit of time, I think that I come to understand the world I live in more. And what I want to do um, is, in my writing, make more space and more time for work that intrigues me and interests me, because I think that work makes the world a, a better place um, by building the possibilities for um, deeper, truer, um, more long-lasting, civilizing discourse. And I think that, that ultimately that's what my job as a, as a critic is. Um, and I think that, the, that um, a large part of what draws me to the newspaper is that um, I'm dealing with the public life of objects. And I think in our um, internet age, um, public space is, um, is changing radically and quickly, and not always for the, the better. And one thing that I like about um, newspaper criticism is that, is, is that it's one of the only occasions for a formal public response to exhibitions. I'm a big fan of um, galleries um, as opposed to um, art fairs and auctions because um, to me, a, a, an artist making a show for a gallery uh, assumes that a bunch of the work is going to be seen in one space for a good chunk of time. Now, usually, sometimes four weeks, um, sometimes up to now it's six weeks because the dealers don't want to take the shows down and, and pay for shipping um, as often. But to me, that work is out there in a public space available to um, almost anyone who comes in to see it. You know, of course, you have to. You can't be working two or three or four jobs and have time to go around and look at art. So there is, there is a certain amount of um, you know, economic wherewithal that you have to have to have the leisure to look at art. But it's, you know, once that's gotten beyond, it's free. And it still is one of the, you know, the, the last few free things out there. And I'm drawn to that. To that world, you know, a lot of pe um, people think it's intimidating, but it, you know, it, to me, it's not nearly as intimidating as going into Barney's or some high-end store where their salespeople are on top of you right away. That uh, these may be expensive objects, but it, I don't think that the only meaning that accrues to an object is um, a dollar and cents sign or a, a dollar sign with loads of zeros. To me, there's there's loads of value that accrues to work that isn't um, contained by the, the monetary value. And that's something that I think I do as a critic, is engage these things in a discussion where then I put my view out there and invite other people to respond to it. And I think that I, um, I, can, I actually have intimate relationships with works of art out in the world without having to own them. Um, I think um, art fairs, which are a new phenomena, are a bit of a problem because artists make works for these fairs, which then last for four or five days in places like Miami Beach or Basel, Switzerland. And you know, if you can fly there and go there, you can see this work crowded into a phone booth size um, booth, among other work. And usually, it's the high-end collectors 
gobble it up and put it in storage and it's gone. And to me, the problem with that isn't that they bought it, but that it doesn't have a, a public life. And I like the work that, that goes out into the world and actually um, lets people go see it and go, go back to it. One of my um, happiest moments as a critic um, was uh, years ago um, when I reviewed a show at a gallery, then I'll go back to the gallery that for the next show, and the dealers usually come over, scampering over, and right away they say, oh, thank you so much for the review. Um, we, we really appreciate your support. And in my mind, I say, like, um, jockstraps provide support. Brasiers provide support. I'm actually not one of those for your art. I'm doing something a, a little bit different, but I don't say that. And I say, like, you're, you're welcome. Um, but they, one of them said, um, um, it was really wonderful, the review you uh, wrote for us last show because I got a call from someone, and they, you know, they asked uh, what our hours were, what our location was, and then they asked me how much it was to go to a gallery. And you know, you had to answer, it's, it's free. And I'm interested in, in a, um, reaching those kind of people. To me, that was, a, that was an art virgin. That was someone who wasn't an art insider, and it's someone who just happened to read the newspaper for whatever reason, maybe they were looking for a movie review, they found an art review, they read it, they were intrigued by it, they followed up on it, and they wanted to see the show. And to me, then, the, a whole door to another world opens in, in that moment, where that stuff is out there available to people. And that's one reason I really like writing for a newspaper, because the, um, uh, my review will be out there in public space um, at the same time that the show is up. I used to write a lot more for arts publications, and those would take so long to go through the the editorial process, the printing process, that the reviews would come out two months after the show was down. And it was still, it's, you know, it's, it's okay, people have, have memories, but I, I love writing about stuff um, that people can actually read what I say, go check it out for themselves, and have a, 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 a response to both, both of those, those things. I think that, um, as a critic, my first job in going into the show is to have an experience. And one way I try to have an experience in the show is first um, try to just be a sponge and kind of be passive and just like soak up as much of the art as I can. And I, so I think that I, I don't have this idea that um, I'm a critic with a checklist with the 10 features I'm looking for in a work, and I'm gonna go around today until I find the show that has the most and then write about that one. I don't have that kind of like, what are the criteria for great, great work. Um, I try to judge the work or evaluate the work or take in the work on its own terms. And then after I feel like I've, I've kind of, as much as I can, taken it in on its own terms, then I'll try to evaluate those terms. Um, so it's kind of a two-level attack um, or a, a approach. Um, uh, uh, lost my position. Uh, train of thought. A, a lot of um, back to the the Barney's analogy. Uh, a lot of people um, think of the art world as a, as an elitist place, where it's you 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 have to be of a certain level. You have to be an insider. You have to be. This that there's a they you know assume that there's a level of difficulty to the to the work. Um, I'm not interested in that kind of elitist side to the art world. I think that it has much much more to do with interest. And the way I like to to phrase it is that um, when I pick up the sports pages and start reading the sports pages, I can uh, turn to an article when the NHL isn't on strike and um, start reading about hockey, and I don't understand anything, or, or much of anything. But I don't believe that's because hockey is elitist. I believe that's because I'm not interested in hockey. And I think that if, um, it, if one has the interest in art, one can educate themselves pretty quickly over you know, months, years, and become an intelligent, participatory fan of it. But I think that it, what really matters is one's interest in the stuff, um, and that it isn't, an, it, it isn't the sort of exclusionary practice 
that it's often made out to be. It's, it's, it is the sort of thing that people um, do uh, feel that they, they have some connection to it and can say something right away about it. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that that's, that the, that's the case, but I think with like, paying attention, doing your homework, going to see shows, educating yourself, um, you can become an, an, an active um, uh, fan of the, of the thing. A lot of um, people think that it's my job as a critic to educate the public, and I think that that's just false. I really think that I take my job as an educator here very seriously. I take my job as a critic very seriously, and they're really not connected. Um, I think they're really, really different. And to me, they're, they're structurally different in that while I think it's possible for readers to learn something from my reviews, I'm not writing them setting out to educate my readers. And to me, um, an educator is in a privileged position with um, special experience, wisdom, knowledge, background, um, expertise that one passes on as an educator to students who then go out into the world and, and, and do their thing. I don't do that in the newspaper. In the newspaper, I tell it like it is with me and then offer it to you, the reader, and say, go check it out and figure it out if it isn't like that for you. I think of it as kind of a, a post-Luther way of going at it. Um, to me, um, before Luther, we had God, and then we had the priests, and then we had the faithful. And the only way that the faithful could get to God was through the clergy. So in a very real sense, the clergy were gatekeepers to divinity. And, that the, and if the, the, the low-life people wanted to get to the, the highest of highs, they had to go through the the, the gatekeepers. I think a lot of my pals who are critics act as if they're priests. And over here we would have art in God's position. Rather than, than the clergy, we have critics. And down here we have viewers. And there are loads of critics who, acts like, who act like the only way that you guys are going to get to that is through us. And we've got the keys to the kingdom. We've got the insight. We've got the wisdom. And we're going to sell that to you and then you can get there. I think that that's really old-fashioned and wrong-headed, and I don't, and personally, I, that's, I, don't, I don't work that way. I still think there is um, art out there in the position of divinity, but what I do in my reviews, uh, I think, is like, I relate myself to that directly and in an unmediated fashion as possible, and then I say to other viewers over here, this is how it works with me, why don't you go check it out with yourself and see if that's not true? So I talk to them about that. And I say, you should compare that to this and see if it doesn't make sense. And so for me, that the real structural difference is there is that I'm on the same plane as other viewers. I'm not presenting myself as an, an expert with any sense of expertise or knowledge that they have to go through to get the goods. Um, and I, do, I really, truly believe that it's my job to state how it is with me in as persuasive a way as possible to convince other people that they should check it out and see if that isn't true for them, too. And I'm happy if they disagree. But I want, so I'm, I'm much more of a conversation builder and dialogue continuer than someone who thinks he has the, the last word. For a long time, um, people think, oh, you're, it must be great being a critic because you get the last word on shows. And, it's, and I've never felt I've had the last word on, on anything. Maybe theater critics can have the kind of influence where they can, they can shut down a show if it's off Broadway and it doesn't work out so well. But uh, I've, I've only ever initiated talk about things. And for me, it, it's, it's a, a, a ripple outward effect. And, and, the, and the, the, the more power one has as a critic is in not with the last word, but more like the first word, the, getting the, the conversation 
going and getting the, 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 the talk um, happening. Um, I think that um, people have a much easier time with movie critics than with, with art critics, and I, I think that that may just because we're, the people are more comfortable around movies. But when I read movie critics, I will get to know the critic, and then I will judge what the critic says about something in accordance with my judgment of the critic. So for example, there's a critic at the LA Times who um, always likes movies that I don't like and almost always doesn't like movies that I really like. So I don't read this critic for the truth or for the last word. I read him with my understanding of what we usually like and filter everything through that. And I think that, that people should look at art critics in the same way, that not only do you need don't ever look at a critic as like a clear lens or prescription glasses to get a clear view of stuff, but um, get to know the critic, and then you can get to know the work knowing the critic's predispositions. And, that it, and I, I just treat, I, I think of my, my readers as smart enough to be able to, to do that. Um, I think that um, what I do as a critic um, is not objective in, in any way, shape, or form, that every single letter and word in every single review is a matter of subjectivity. And in that way, I'm, um, what I do has much less to do with what's on the front page in the newspaper than the opinions page. And, the, and the, I think what goes on the opinions page is people making passionate and committed arguments for things they believe in. And I think that that's what any kind of um, newspaper criticism and you know, magazine criticism is. That it's not me trying to be fair and objective and to see the story from as many sides as possible, which I would think that's the responsibility of my journalist friends who are doing news. My responsibility is to figure out what I think and argue for that in as persuasive a manner as, as possible. And that um, a lot of my, and so it's, to me, uh, what's central to my job as a critic is judgment. That I will, I'm, you know, I'm gonna make judgments about stuff in the world and present those judgments to you readers. Um, not too long ago, there's a study at Columbia um, University about, you know, about asking actual critics what they thought their job was, and only 8% said they thought making judgments mattered. And to me, that's just depressing as hell, because to me, that's the, that's the, main, the main thing. And they, they really felt the job were, was to, um, to educate and to uplift and to be, to be fair. And really, it was uh, you know, much more of an ed uh, educative model than a than a judgment model. And I'm, I just get tired of reading reviews where it's like, the critic will say, on the one hand, so-and-so's work could be great. On the other hand, it may not be. And to me, that's like, go home and do your job. You figure out how it is with you, and then make the argument. And then I'll decide if your argument is any good or not. But that, to me, that waffling pretense towards uh, balance is, is, is nuts. Um, let me see if I have, a, I have some notes to see if I forgot, um, forgot anything. Oh, well, yeah. A lot of people will say, um, your job as a critic is really to put art in its context. That like, art is, is this unruly thing that just throws itself up in the world, and your job is to kind of take it, press it down, um, fold it up, tidy its corners, and put it in the drawer that it belongs in. And to me, that's just getting it bass backwards. That to me, the, the, a large part of the critic's job is to put the viewer in the arts context. So I've, I aim at addressing a group of people that might be interested in something, and I try to bring them to it to make its argument um, stronger and more vivid and, and, and more clear. One thing that I say to my students um, here is that as a critic, I actually don't write about art. As a critic, I write about my responses to art. And to me, there's like, there's a, it, it, I do it partly to kind of 
poke and prod them because most of my students are artists um, and that they think that you know I should be writing about what they're what they're doing. Um, but I like to uh, make the little difference. Like that thing that they did has to do something to me, and that's what I'm gonna gonna account for. Um, it's a uh, criticism's position in in our culture is odd and, and changing and shrinking and, and mutating. And it's um, recently there's been loads and loads of TV shows where there's say a, a group of women want to be supermodels, a group of chefs want to be um, the winning chef, um, a group of uh, home redecorators want to redecorate the home in the best way. There's other ones like this. We have kind of these um, competitions which get judged. And when I first saw that, I was like, oh my god, criticism suddenly is much more important than it's ever been in a while. We're going to get a lot of uh, play to you know, watching these panels of judges make decisions about singers and models and houses and plates of food. And I, didn't, I haven't watched a whole lot of them, but the few that I did watch um, didn't interest me at all because the, the, um, to me, the critics weren't, ex weren't doing their job as critics because they were just talking about their taste. They were just said like, well, I like this and I, I don't like that. Um, and, it, and to me, there's a profound difference in um, my taste and what I care about in, in art. To me, I, the, the taste is of little consequence. It's like I, I prefer a pepperoni pizza to a ham and pineapple pizza. But I don't think that really matters. If you, if you prefer uh, you know, green onions and and anchovies, that's fine. That the, the, the differences and distinguished features at le that level to me aren't interesting in the way of like, if I'm more interested in a Carl Benjamin painting um, to uh, a Julian Schnabel painting, those things include um, ideas about the world that's out there and the world that could be out there. There's those, to me, those are consequential differences and it's the critic's job to lay out and argue for those differences. And these shows left me with like, oh, I, I like tall leggy models or I, I like the, the, the other kind of models or wh whatever, that level. And, it, and they also were even worse than just being about taste and not being about um, critical judgment. They struck me that right away the camera would zoom in on the um, people getting booted off, I mean the losers, and they wanted to know, they wanted to see, you know, feel, see and feel someone else his pain as they were experiencing it. And it, to me, it immediately went like back to the artist's studio to see about the work that didn't work out. And to me, they were really all about um, failure and one's emotional response to failure rather than, than anything else. And to me, it's like, I, that was like, as a critic, getting away from the public response of the work to kind of this behind the scenes secret stuff of like the, you know, your true feelings about not being a, a success or, a, or a, um, for about being a, a failure. Um, I choose the shows that I'm gonna write about in t by um, asking myself what would make the best review. Um, so my, uh, I'm, you know, no bones about it, I'm making a product and it's this little piece of writing called a review, which in newspapers is getting shorter and shorter and shorter um, all the time. But I'm committed to making that best. Often the best kinds of reviews are the, to really, really strong responses. I have two shows where if I, if I really am intrigued by something or if I'm really um, offended by something, that makes for more exciting writing than if I just kind of go in like, hmm this work is fine. And it's that kind of fine, bland, middle of the road stuff that doesn't uh, usually make for particularly compelling writing. Um, but uh, that's the kind of, of question I'll ask myself. And it's also, there's a, I write about a wide range of artists from people just out of school or just beginning their careers to people who have been, you know, had full careers and have died and now have um, full afterlife careers. Um, and, it's, and so when I'm writing about a show, I'm not just writing about the work in the show, but I'm also writing about other writing about the show and that artist's reputation, that uh, the critics who are behind that artist and, and all of that sort of thing. So I can, um, 
I can argue against what has been said about the work, and, and that's why and people say, well, that's really not fair to the work. But again, I'm not here to be fair to the work. I'm here to um, continue and carry on a, a civilizing public discourse. And I think that, um, um, Oh, that, that's one reason I had you guys um, read the, the Oscar Wilde, is that I think Wilde had this real sense that just talking about things, just arguing about things, um, just fighting over things actually had a civilizing influence on people. And I think that in our culture now, um, where it's public life and political discourse is becoming, um, to me, flattened and one-dimensional and all or nothing, where it's like, you know, Yes, no, Democrat, Republican, yeah, for this, against that. It's just like, it's all, you know, likes, dislikes, that there's no, um, there's no gray area, or the gray, is, the gray is shrinking. I think that the visual arts provide an area that's almost all gray, in that it actually um, pays off people who have complex and nuanced responses to things, and if you have the, the ability to hold conflict together in your mind, I think that that makes you a, a more interesting person on one level, and on another level, makes it less likely that you're one of these kind of like one-dimensional knee-jerk pawns of the um, divide and conquer nature of, of um, lots of um, public, public discourse. Um, as a as a critic, I don't think of myself as a historian. That's way 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 too fast for that. I think the, the work that I'm writing about, you know, maybe it's a candidate for history, but that won't be sorted out for a long long time. So in a sense, what I do is much more like the six o'clock news than the art history textbooks. Um, and I think that's probably enough about what I think I do. Um, and the, um, the, the, re the, the second half, I have um, eight really short reviews that I've written over a period of, from 95 to now, 16 years, um, of uh, Monique Prieto's um, paintings. So this is, a, a, to me, a neat little um, instance where at the, at the news, where I've actually got to say something about um, someone over a long expanse of time and kind of by lucking out at the, uh, at the newspaper, we can't um, cherry pick what's gonna be coming up at, at shows. Like, uh, there's four, uh, four people who do the Around the Galleries column. And so whatever opens this week, this critic gets first shot at. Um, whatever opens this week, this critic gets first shot at, along with everything this critic didn't pick, and, and so on. So it's a, this is a, an occasion where either Monique Prieto's shows opened the week I was writing, or the critic the week, or the, in the two weeks before me, chose not to do them. So when I, when I go through these, it's, um, it's, um, it's a moment where I get revenge upon the poets. Because I've always been jealous that poets could just go to a reading and, and or a presentation, just read what they'd written, and art critics never get to do that. So I'm going to read my reviews as if it were poetry. No, uh, <laughs> uh, you can um, actually. What I want you to pay attention to is um, how Monique's work changes from 1995 to uh, to 2012, and also watch how uh, my writing changes from 1995 to uh, to 2012, and how the uh, and how some you know and how Sometimes it doesn't, and there's bad habits in there, in there all the way. But that's like, that's one thing um, about my path as a critic is I didn't learn to do it in school or in graduate school. And actually, after I went out in the world, I learned how to be a critic by being a critic. So it's a, a at times very embarrassing public education. Um, and when I have occasions to go back and look at the early things, I just um, cringe and, um, and, and shriek. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it's, a, it's a, I, mean, I don't know if that's the best model for how to, um, to make a critic, but it's a, it's, it is really different from 
uh, the writing I did in graduate school, which is even worse than the writing I did in the, in the newspaper or the other, the magazines early on. Um, but to go, to get started, let's see. This. So in, in 1994, um, I've been writing for the LA Times for, for three years, and I went to a show, and I saw um, paintings like that, and paintings like that, and I thought, huh, this work isn't very interesting. I'm not going to write about it. And I didn't. Um, I also thought, like, you know, she's a young artist. It's her first show out of graduate school. Um, there's no reason to go after it um, uh, with a bazooka when a fly swatter would do. It's, to me, it was like a small fish, so why, why kill it? Um, and it just, it did, and I thought, like, huh, it just kind of, you know, you know great. Uh, not just, I just wasn't, I didn't, it, to me, it, the, the, I walked into the show, looked at it, considered it, and thought it, it doesn't merit a review. And, the, and that, was, that was that. Then um, a one short year went by, and I walked into a show that had this painting in it, and I thought, like, whoa, time to get the um, typer out and, and write something. So this is what I wrote on November 2nd, 1995. Monique Prieto's second solo show contains six of the quickest, most exciting paintings of recent memory. At Acme Gallery, the young LA-based artist acrylics on raw canvas marry graphic design and color field painting to form idiosyncratic offspring so odd they cannot be accounted for by their sources. Each image begins as a simple abstract configuration on Prieto's computer. Between seven and 30 oblong blobs or rounded rectangles appear in each painting. All of these cartoonish shapes are neatly painted a single flat color that's applied so thinly the pigment is completely absorbed into the weave of the canvas like an intractable stain. Even the locations of Prieto's well-placed drips are worked out on the computer long before the artist begins to mix her unique synthetic colors. Prieto's drips never consist of thick rivulets nor end in three-dimensional droplets. As flat as an image on a monitor, they also defy gravity by staining the canvas at impossible angles and for illogical lengths. Making a virtue of superficiality, Prieto's fresh paintings stick in your mind's eye long after you've stopped looking at them. Confidently thin, they deftly form compelling pictures without being heavy-handed. And then a, a year later, um, she had another show and I wrote this. The smallest painting in Monique Prieto's buoyant exhibition at Acme Gallery ranks among the spunkiest she has made. Composed of only six eccentric shapes of crisp color, this multi-purpose picture compresses into 18 by 14 inches of raw canvas, no less than four genres of painting, portraiture, still life, landscape, and modernist abstraction. On first glance, Prieto's playful composition looks like a jaunty offshoot of an early Jules Olitsky. Did, did I? Did I get? I thought I had. Was that Al? Oh dear. Is it there? There we go. Okay. Um, Having sharpened the edges of the spray painted blobs that punctuate the color field painter's quirky canvases, Prieto has also rendered these loopy shapes in uniform hues and shrunk them down to size, transforming their overblown as aspirations into a goofy, user friendly cartoon. As a result, her pop abstraction is as jubilant as any mid career painting by Tom Wesselman. Titled Losing Ground, that's what I was looking for. Its palette exactly matches the one Wesselman employed to depict a suite of radically cropped nudes reclining resplendently in the foreground of gorgeous seascapes. Depending upon which shape you focus on in Prieto's compact painting, the overall image seems to depict different subjects. If the vase-shaped, peach-colored configuration toward the bottom dominates, the painting reads as a still life of stylized flowers. If the golden crescent near the top holds your attention, the work resembles a portrait of a languid, blue-eyed blonde. And if the swatch of sky, bl sky blue that rests on a horizontal section of dark blue grabs your eye, the slippery image looks like a traditional, if strangely framed, seascape. The remaining nine paintings in Prieto's 
impressive exhibition similarly shift between abstraction and representation. With great efficiency and deftness, they demonstrate that neither type of image making tells the whole story. Impossible to pin down with any certainty, the zany shapes in these subtly colored works exaggerate and intensify the ambiguities on which all visual art is based. Titled The Big Picture, Prieto's show insists upon the repressed pop edginess of color field painting. This devilishly clever maneuver reveals that redeeming the most derided style of modernist abstraction is infinitely more interesting than criticizing its shortcomings. Although knowledge feeds into Prieto's lively recycling of art history's dullest moments, pleasure predominates in this process. You don't have to know the sources of her smart, generous pictures to have fun looking at their exuberant, animated compositions. And then a year later, another show, another review, as I'm becoming her personal biographer. If you're among the many viewers who believe that abstract painting has to be serious, even somber, if it's to be sophisticated, then head over to Monique Prieto's exhibition at Acme Gallery to see nine snappy paintings that just might change your mind. So gleeful that their cheerfulness rubs off on you, these buoyant abstractions demonstrate that contemporary art can be frivolous and compelling, as silly as a cartoon and as uplifting as pure joy. Above all else, Prieto's paintings are a pleasure to see. If you have even the slightest sense of humor, they'll cause the corners of your mouth to curve upward in the beginning of a grin. If your imagination hasn't been completely overrun by the rational parts of your brain, a smile might even break out in your face. After so much art designed to invite only scowls and smirks as signs of its seriousness, it's refreshing to see art that takes delight seriously. Such bodily responses have been at the heart of Prieto's crisp pictures for the past four years. In that short time, the young LA-based painter has established herself as one of the most accomplished and promising artists of her generation. In the past, a typical painting by Prieto consisted of numerous blobs of single eye-popping colors, often animated by long antennae-like drips reaching out in gravity-defying directions. Each shape seemed to be an incredibly flexible two-dimensional balloon that had jostled, jiggled, and snuggled up to its neighbors until every part of the picture had settled into the most comfortable position. In the new works, which are still painted on tautly stretched expanses of raw canvas, the blobs have gotten thinner and the drips have gotten thicker. It's often impossible to know whether you're looking at a fat line or a plump shape that's been stretched out to its limits. What is clear is that all of these eccentric configurations seem to be cooperating with one another to achieve a shared goal. Nearly all of the amoeba-like blobs are oriented vertically extending upward as if fueled by the desire to get closer to the sun. Most of the chubby drips have circled around on themselves to form squiggly circles or coiled up as if mimicking a spring's spirals. In every case, these loopy shapes appear to lift off the ground with optimistic verve. With a remarkable economy of means, Prieto has fused the giddiness of color field painting with the razor sharp graphics of pop art while making a mess of the distinctions between abstraction and representation. Likewise, fun and sophistication are never at cross purposes in her acrobatic works, on whose playful surfaces rigor and promiscuity dovetail with the greatest of ease. And then um, we sk skip two years. Um, so I'm not sure if she had another show in there or just um, more time between shows. Um, but this is what I wrote in May, on May Day um, in 1999. Adults often dismiss abstract art by saying, my kid could do that. But at Acme Gallery, Monique Prieto's new work turns the standard dismissal inside out. The show suggests that the issue is not whether a kid could make her paintings, but whether a kid likes them. The difference is significant. To say that a kid could have done it is to assert that what we admire in art is its degree of difficulty, how well an artist has demonstrated his or her mastery of a medium. To ask if a kid likes it is to put a priority on pleasure. Where the former inquires about how something was done in the past, the latter emphasizes what art does to you in the present. Prieta's snazzy abstractions have an instantaneous appeal that doesn't wear thin on second, third, or fourth viewings. At once joyous and intelligent, her radiant paintings of indescribable shapes squiggling and shimmying across pristine expanses of raw canvas are the adult version of children's storybooks. 
In the same way that a child will want to hear a favorite story over and over again, Prieto's crisp images remain fresh and vivacious no matter how many times you see them. More narrative than her earlier work, the seven big canvases and four small etchings highlight Prieto's skills as a colorist with an impressive array of strange tertiary colors and hot and cold tones setting edgy off-balance moods. The razor sharp contours of the single color shapes are also more irregular than before with myriad nooks and crannies meandering every which way. Although Prieto designs her images on a computer, her jittery idiosyncratic contours have less to do with pixelated imagery than with the desire to infuse her art with a sense of nervous animation. This quivering visual energy plays off the architectural solidity of her compositions, suggesting that their stacked shapes could topple in an instant. Plus, these precariously balanced blobs are not plump and bulbous like inflated balloons, but wrinkled and withered like ancient stalagmites or weathered mountain ranges. Embodying time's passage with effortless ease, Prieto's paintings demonstrate that art does not need to look difficult to be serious. Then two more years go by, and um, another show at Acme, and another review by me. Monique Prieto's new paintings are more like clouds than any of her previous works. In the same way that clouds sometimes assemble themselves in your imagination to form ships, camels, or gigantic faces, the abstract shapes in her acrylics on canvas appear to depict elaborate scenes, uncannily dark dramas filled with more emotional turmoil and tortured ambivalence than are usually found in contemporary art, especially for an artist whose paintings have a reputation for being light and cheery. This mood is set by the palette of Prieto's eight works at Acme Gallery. Dominated by an impressive range of muted blues, the show's serious tone is rounded out by rainy day grays, earthy browns, and midnight blacks. Accents from the other end of the spectrum steer clear of the exuberance that once animated the LA artist's cartoon-inspired works, replacing its playfulness with the poignancy of bruised reds, injured pinks, and grungy yellows. Always able to make sparks fly along the lines where positive and negative space meet, Prieto juices up figure ground relationships in her new works to give them the feel of high speed collisions. More complex than before, the craggy contours of her monochrome shapes outline fractured gaps and splintered fissures that are as potent as any painted portion. She also complicates the relationships among her wildly irregular forms. With more legs, arms, tendrils, and peninsulas than previous shapes had, the new ones stretch themselves across unpainted backgrounds until they come near the edges of the canvas, which they never touch, or abut, one an or abut another indescribable shape, which they never overlap. Some lock together like jigsaw puzzle pieces. Others grind against one another like the gears of a car's transmission when its clutch is let out too quickly. Still others recall such natural phenomena as an insect's antennae delicately exploring its surroundings, or a root growing in the crack of a rock until it splits in two. Every square inch of Prieto's variously scaled paintings feels as if it's under pressure, compressed by the modern anxiety of trying to pack a day's commitments and responsibilities into 24 short hours. The open-ended psychodramas she stages with whiplash efficiency in Departure, Merciless, and Blue Again involve life-defining struggles between the individual and the group. But the most powerful paintings, which are also the largest, give eloquent voice to the unseen torment that boils inside people whenever we want to do one thing, but know we should do something else. Edgar Allan Poe called such irrepressibly self-destructive desires the imp of the perverse, a description that suits the inward spiraling violence implied by heedless and cause and effect. Like all of the works in Prieto's breakthrough exhibition, these surprisingly chilling paintings resonate with the troubling ambiguity that once fueled the fires of surrealism. Th that review, I was really happy with that because at the time, um, Monique was um, characterized by her detractors as just a, a painter of um, eye candy and, and fluff and pretty pictures. And I was, um, I wanted, I didn't think it was that, um, but I wanted to get the, um, the emotional power and the kind of the other side of the emotional spectrum in the in the picture. So 
cause and effect. And then, oh, and then a big chunk of time passes. Now it's um, six years later. So pause for a drink. Um, and this, this was a gap where um, I didn't miss reviews. It was actually she, she didn't show. Um, and, that, uh, and so she came out in this show in 2007 with, with word paintings. Um, and I wrote, when Monique Prieto began exhibiting her work in 1994, just about the dorkiest thing an artist could do was make abstract paintings. Times have changed. Abstraction is no longer as uncool as it used to be. And Prieto, ever the free-thinking maverick, has abandoned the comforting familiarity of her crisp acrylics on raw canvas for works even dorkier and more out of step than before. Messy pictures of blocky letters that spell out phrases from the nine volume diary of 17th century Englishman Samuel Pepys. At Acme Gallery, Prieto's oils on canvas bring image and text conceptualism front and center by turning its conventions inside out. Rather than using words as explanatory captions, she uses brushes, blotters, palette knives, and rollers to paint phrases that are as satisfying to look at as they are to read. The meanings that emerge require viewer participation, ample imagination, and the give and take of real conversations, particularly those that include confusion, opacity, and contentious argumentation. One of the best things about Prieto's paintings is that each seems to be out of sync or out of step with itself. In contrast to her earlier works, in which every element cooperated with its companions to form harmonious wholes, her new ones remain unresolved and unsettled. Dissonance is their goal and modus operandi. Prieto builds this complexity into raw Stone Age style pictures. The first time you see one, reading its blocky text is difficult. You are forced to sound out syllables like a school kid. But once you read the words, the painting's illegibility disappears, and it is impossible to recapture. Remembering it becomes an element of each subsequent viewing, which increasingly focuses on the visual play between positive and negative space, accident and intention, structure and its undoing. It's heartening to see an artist embrace meanings too slippery, various, and filled with potential to be part of soundbite message mongering. So that was 2007. And the next show is in 2009. Hmm. Um, and I wrote, Fifteen years ago, Monique Prieto burst onto the scene with a series of squeaky clean canvases that changed the way people thought about abstract painting in Los Angeles. Five years ago, she turned her back on the crisply composed monochrome blobs that had become her signature, ditched acrylics for oils, and began painting pictures of phrases borrowed from the nine-volume diary of 17th century Englishman Samuel Pepys in a style best described as caveman graffiti. That stunning shift from hard edge abstraction to messy image and text conceptualism pales in comparison to the changes that have, been take, that have taken place between Prieto's earliest word paintings and her new ones at Acme Gallery. The 13 works in A Boat Full of Spaniards Singing are the best canvases Prieto has painted. Richer, subtler, and more complex, they are also more wide ranging, ambitious, and psychologically charged than the work she has exhibited since 1994 in 11 consistently terrific LA solo shows. Everything in Prieto's new paintings is more sophisticated, more seasoned and more sensitive, yet less precious, pointed, and eager to please. Confidence and sweetness commingle in ways rarely seen in art or in life. This makes for paintings that invite the best from viewers and embody a type of interactive optimism that is anything but naive. The phrases Prieto picks from Peep's down-to-earth diaries are shorter and more open. Most include only two or three words, mad in love, yesterday and today, humility and gravity. Ah, looking another way and repent, repent. Even those with more words, such as smoke in the ruins, as much as we could, and it was done in the street by strangers, are pretty generic, 
applicable to different situations and evocative of diverse storylines. Prieto's palette mostly consists of washed out colors. Sun faded passages look as if they have endured extreme temperatures. Turpentine thin sections suggest scarce resources, serious frugality, and stubborn determination. Yet supersaturated pinks, blues, and golds add electrifying jolts to the overall mellowness of Prieto's scuffed up surfaces. This emphasizes that inconsistency is the lifeblood of idiosyncrasy and the heart and soul of these stirring paintings. The most significant changes to Prieto's art are compositional. The suggestion of 3D space enters the picture as never before, as does a sense of swirling vertiginous movement. Both recall such early 20th century American masters as Stanton McDonald Wright, Arthur Dove, and George O'Keefe, along with such inc incompatible influences as Robert Delaunay, Milton Avery, Philip Guston, and Pierre Bernard. Prieto makes the madcap melange look not just sensible, but strangely beautiful, a mix and match patchwork that partakes in the make-do adaptability of crazy quilts and the polyglot cacophony of suave cosmopolitanism. Profoundly generous and deeply satisfying, her new paintings are among the most free-spirited works being made today. Looking at them never gets old, it gets better. And then finally, um, two years later, um, just about a year ago, this is October 21st, 2011. Time enough, Monique Prieto's 12th solo show in Los Angeles is nothing and everything like her previous exhibitions. It's Prieto at her best, surprising viewers, myself included, who thought they knew what she was up to while pushing us out of our comfort zones and into a world of serious curiosity. In the past, Prieto's exhibitions have consisted of single bodies of work. At ACME, her wonderfully puzzling exhibition includes at least two and maybe four bodies of work. On the east wall of the first gallery is a salon-style arrangement of eight oils on canvas. That's that. Ranging in size from six feet by five feet to 20 inches by 30 inches, these swiftly painted still lifes are a show unto themselves. Each treats pigment as if it were more valuable than tulip bulbs in 1637. The same goes for sophistication of palette, composition, and text. Prieto handles all of these elements as if she had neither the time nor the luxury to make anything pretty. All the right references are present in these slapdash pictures, including nods to Giorgio Morandi, George Brock, Francis Picabia, Marsden Hartley, Mary Heilman, and Lawrence Wiener. But Prieto evokes the, their trademark styles with su such ham-fisted lumpiness, you can't help but think it's wrong-headed. That's part of the fun. Her playful paintings make you think for yourself. In the second gallery, nine similarly sized and slightly larger paintings feature one, two, and three word phrases taken from Samuel Pepys' 17th century autobiography. In most, candy colored rays shine out from Prieto's Flintstone style words, cutting across the raw canvas like movie premiere spotlights. These are the first works in which Prieto quotes herself. Like the Ouroboros, it's a form of self cannibalization that is illogical yet generative, disquieting yet fertile. The ink drawings in the third gallery add more loose ends to Prieto's slippery exhibition. In three, six, and 30 parts, they make it hard to, dis hard to distinguish between parts and holes while suggesting that when it comes to art that's alive, nothing sits still. And that's all I have, but I'd be happy to be take quest yeah. questions. Yeah, I'd be happy to, to answer anything about absolutely anything. Yeah, yeah. Does anyone have any, any questions about, is everything perfectly clear? Um, so my question is, you said that you're mostly drawn to contemporary art. Could yeah. you say something about um, why that is? Yeah, and I was in um, graduate school in art history, because I, I, I knew I was interested in art. And while I was in graduate school in art history, it was becoming clear to me um, that I was being trained as a historian whose subject matter happened to be art. And I was um, much less interested in the past than in, in the present. 
Um, and so I dropped out of the PhD program in, in art history and moved to Los Angeles to write about contemporary work. And part of it's that um, I'm interested in the time that I live in, and I think that um, these are really confusing and exciting and strange times, and I think that art is one way into that, to that world, so I'd say that, you know, that was a, a personal choice. I have gr immense respect for historians. Um, I have great suspicion of historicizing the present, and there's a, I think a, a, there's a, when I was in grad school, I was most interested in Warhol, and my faculty basically said, like, that's too recent to talk about. You really need to go back further. Um, now I'm in you know places where you where you know Cindy Sherman is a topic for dissertations, and that to me it's the yeah the past is happening too too fast, and and so I and part of my um, I think job as a critic is just is to make room for the the present, which is something that you know maybe down the line historians will will care about. But I kind of way I kind of like I want to generate data for future historians and figure out what my world is. Does that make, make sense? Yeah. Huh? Darren, I love your name tags. Thank you. <laughs> um, you mentioned that, mm -hmm. uh, or, or you kind of complained about mm -hmm. uh, critics on the television shows mm -hmm. uh, using oh. their taste. Uh -huh. uh, I was wondering if you think that there is there any correlation? It, does the critic have uh, a more highly developed taste than someone else, or it is um, it's? Or I guess what makes a good critic? Yeah, yeah. To me, the uh, the kind, I I really really want to insist upon my kind of Luther post Luther model, where it isn't a um, it's not me talking down to someone else, that I, I always want that uh, mode of address between me and reader to be an equal, equal one. Um, um, so I treat myself as a viewer, um, and maybe as a viewer who's spent more time viewing than lots of other viewers, so I would be comfortable with being an exemplary viewer, but not as an elevated or an expertise Viewer, I think um, you know. With criticism, the the proof is in the pudding. That if you if you write a review that's um, persuasive, convincing, and draws people into a discussion, um, that's what matters. It doesn't matter that in the past you did that a lot. No, and that's one thing about the you know being a living artist or being a living critic. It's you know, it's kind of like Hollywood say, You're only as good as your last. Movie to me with this game, it's like you're only as as good as that one review. If you if you know if you're off, write a stinker, miss the point, whatever. That's that happens, and uh, you know one hopes that one gets better as one keeps at it, but there's no guarantees. It's and it's and I it's uh, I also think that you know you're only as good as your reputation. If you if you just start liking everything everywhere. And kind of become the the Will Rogers of art criticism, you, know, you, you go away. Or if you become a, a, a formulaic crank, it goes away. To me, it's there's something really heartening about it. It's like it's you know, it's each review has to do its thing, or it it's not worth the. You used to say that it's not worth the paper it's printed on. Now it's like it's not worth the what the the electron whatever the, the digital the, the 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 zeros and ones that that convey it. Thank you. Hmm? Judith? You mentioned that you weren't really interested in hearing gallery owners tell you yeah. about the artworks. How about the uh, artists themselves telling you about oh, the good, artworks? Good, um, good question. Yeah, um, the, the dealers I just you know, generically don't trust. But actually, there's, there's loads of dealers I really like. But you know, if the dealer did tell me something brilliant in the visit to the gallery, I can't use that. In my, you know, I can't write, you know, Joe Dealer, I, I can't, it's like he's 
shooting himself in the foot by telling me smart things. Um, I joke with my um, students who are mostly artists that I don't listen to them at all. That it's like, that, you know, I, I talk to the, the work talks to me and, and that's, uh, you know, that's enough, you know, shut up and get in, stay in the background where you belong. But I'm kind of, you know, poking at them to, to get them to think. But I do, um, I'm of the school of thought that you can never know too much. That the, I think the more one knows, the more one experiences, the more chance one has to, to see things. So to me, artists are as useful a source of information as, as anything else. I will, however, not talk to the artist as if um, they have this divine and ultimate knowledge of the work. I will talk to artists as viewers, where I think that an artist, I, I don't necessarily engage a conversation with the artist as the maker of the thing, but I do think that a big part of making things is looking at things, and, I'd be, and I'm really intrigued talking to artists about looking at, at stuff. But I never think of it as like, oh, that's what it's all about, and then I have the, the truth. I think of it as you know, more, more data for me to gather and, and make my judgments. Because uh, I, I know critics who are like I will not talk to an artist, or I know other critics who, you know, will just, you know, write verbatim what the artist says. And I'm not the, I'm not a conveyor belt of one's intentions. And to me, it's like if it's not if the work isn't doing it, you can't convince me by what by talking a good game. Do you hear back from the artists? Oh yeah. Uh, the, my, uh, the the mo so yeah the flip side of me not listening to artists is that the most among the most satisfying things are when an artist I really respect says um, I really loved what you said about my work because that made me look at it in a different way and I, I that to me is is great or um, those are some of the things that I've thought about but never been able to to say. Um, even better is when w artist A will talk to me about something I said about artist B, because you you know, usually if I you know if say if you're a painter I rave about your show you email me and say brilliant writing and it's like of course you think it's brilliant writing I was raving about your show but it has a little more um, power for me if like I'm raving about Wendy's show and you say I really liked the way you raved about that because it's like just less this breaking our arms patting each other on the the back and this mutual admiration group group. And then finally, how does a starving graduate student afford art? Oh, um, by getting it from one's friends. I think that, um, that you know, you, uh, you start out cheap and if you can, and it, you, yeah, you get it from your peers before it gets endorsed by experts like myself and the price goes up. Someone in the back? John? Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. Oh. I have the microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's very pragmatic. Sorry, no, John. this is the last, the last question. Sorry, John. <laughs> um, I'm curious when you said you think the public life of objects is changing uh -huh. today. How do you think it's changing? Um, I think it's, uh, it's shrinking. Um, and I think that um, our, you know, while we have more access to more info and more connectedness, that actually like the, the coming together of bodies and stuff in spaces is splintering, fracturing, and dissolving into the ether, in short. Yeah, I think democracy is threatened. Well, I mean, I, I really do. I, I think um, that uh, they, I think journalism is a really important component of democracy, and I think it's, you know smarter people than I think that, and have argued that for for a couple hundred years. Um, and I, I th and, and newspapers are really under are not making it financially, um, and it, and and I think that's a, that's a problem. It really made clear to me years ago. Um, one of my editors, we I was talking with one of my editors, and she said, well, you know, covering the war in Iraq is really expensive. And I actually hadn't really thought about it. Like, whoa, it must be super expensive, actually, to cover, you know, compared to an art review, 
that's really, really expensive. You just send me out across town, I can get it. Um, and it, it made me start to think about, like, you know, long-term investigative journalism needs to be funded. And it's, uh, and historically, you know, newspapers have done that. Some good, good magazines have done that to, like, to not just have, like, you know, turn it out quick stuff to fill the, the headlines, but, like, you know, paying people to uncover political corruption and, and you know, to gather the news. Um, but now, um, it, it, and I think that is, newspapers historically have done that, and if they don't figure out how to make some money through advertising online, we're in trouble as a culture for that kind of information gathering and analysis. So I think there's, there's more information out there, but the way it um, is put together, uh, we're losing, that's diminishing. I mean, just for, as a, a, a and I, I mean, art writing plays a teeny, 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 Part of that, but we've lost a lot of room to to think and argue and analyze in in public because it's just, everything's getting shorter and quicker. Hmm? Yeah, um, I found your relationship with Monique uh, mm -hmm. Prieto really interesting mm -hmm. over the years, and um, that whole idea of like having this dialogue because you started saying that part of your work as a mm -hmm. critic is to have this kind of civil discourse. Mm -hmm. So um, just broadly, one, uh, have you ever taken back your, quote, experiences oh, yeah. that you've written at, and whether <laughs> yeah, yeah. specifically you've had yeah. that kind of dialogue with um, Monique's work or mm -hmm. as an artist, and how did that change your writing and critiques? Well, the with her, um, I haven't changed my mind. I mean, you can see how I've changed my approach and evaluation, but it's pretty much a, a rave all the way, all the way through. Um, one happy little moment in that was um, she wrote a letter, when I called her a dork in one of the, when I said like, uh, you know, call it, uh, abstract, 20, 15 years ago, one of the dorkiest things you could do is make an abstract painting. Um, now that you now she's basically become the, the new dork with her image and text paintings, she wrote a little card that said, like, um, I've, uh, never been happier being called a dork in a complimentary fashion than, than that. So I like that she, she appreciated being called a dork. Um, but it's, um, if I understood the question correctly, is it like, has my, uh, what I've said in one review about an artist's work, um, uh, yeah, no, I, I never wish I could take it back, but I am embarrassed that it's out there. And I, yeah, I have changed my mind. Um, uh, so, say there's an artist named Monica Majoli, um, and I, the early works I dismissed for being sensationalistic and badly painted. And then I, there was this aha moment, of like, oh, you moron. They're not um, sensationalistic at all. You just didn't look at them carefully enough. So yeah, yeah I do change my mind. I don't think that that's a, uh, a huge problem, though. I think that's just the nature of the of the beast. Um, the weird stuff happens is when I, I'll go to a show, review it really positively, and then the artist thinks we're married for life. I have my critic; he's going to be in my corner forever. Uh, and this is this has happened a lot. Then, like their next show, I go to and I don't write about it, and they're like. What's up? You're behind, you're supposed to be my supporter. I'm like oh, I'm not a supporter, um, and it's like um, and I just didn't write it. And the next one you go again, and you don't write it. And then the next one you go and you actually don't like it, and you write something that, that makes them angry, and they think they've been betrayed, and that that happens a lot. Um, and um, other stuff happens where the artists I really respect are the ones who I trash in print, and they're not angry about it in person, or at least they're civilized at openings. And the ones I really, really don't respect are the ones that get in a huff and turn on their heels and walk away when they see me in public because something I said in, in print. And to me, it's just like, that's, it's just part of the job. It's like that's, you, you know, not everyone is gonna agree with you all the, all the time. Um, but yeah, you're, you're Things, things change, artists change. Um, it's, uh, you know, maybe if I, 
there's no guarantee I'd like Monique's, Monique's next show. I'd bet on it, but it's, I mean, I bet it, it wouldn't. But yeah, stuff changes. Is that, is that kind of answer? Hmm? Yeah, um, could you talk a little more about um, historicizing the present? Oh. Maybe like an example you've, you've seen of where that happens and why it's bad. Yeah, um, I think um, that um, the moment, for, I think every moment, or I think lots of moments, um, and I certainly this moment, I think is a, is, is a confusing, contentious, up for grabs time. And I think that um, there's still lots of work for this art to do. And by work, I mean um, for a population or a citizenship to argue about its meanings. And to me, um, kind of this instant turning it into history is, is putting it away or putting it past and not letting it live in the disruptiveness of the, of the present. Because I think we, uh, uh, you know, Rembrandt is a great historical artist, which isn't to say that he doesn't speak to us in the present, but it's different from the way, you know, Monique Prieto's newest paintings speak to us in the, in the present. And I just want to make room for that stuff out there that the jury is still out on. And it, you know, and it, it divides people. It, to me, there is kind of a, when work makes its way into history, it kind of gets um, agreed upon in some terms. And I'm interested in the unagreed uponness of the, the present. And I think there's a danger in art history departments where they, they want to put it into, it kind of, it's like putting it away. Like, you know, Oh, we've got all the drawers for the schools, and we popped this work in there, and this work here, and it's all it's all made sense of and and tidied up. And one thing I like about art is like is how untidy it is, and how it actually can go back into the past and grab things that have been overlooked and bring them into the the, the foreground. And I'm I'm just I'm worried that when it uh, gets turned into history, it's like having to live through molasses, where that gets slowed slowed down. Does that make sense? And it's, it drives me nuts where you'd go to these, like, uh, you know, a class called contemporary art history. And like, you know, please, what is it history or is it con contemporary? It doesn't, it's, and it's fine to be one or the other, but it's not, it's not like just add water, it's history. It's like f the freeze dried present, like bing, and so on. There's no like microwave history. Uh, um. Hi. Oh, I hear a voice. Um, so one thing you said, you said you, that you evaluate work on its own terms, mm -hmm. and then you evaluate those terms. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you could explain the second part and how you weight oh, the importance yeah. of those terms. So, like, uh, so there's, say there's some work out there that um, sets itself out to make um, a really harmonious and pleasing depiction of a bowl of flowers. And so at first I was like, yeah, you know, Samantha Langan, bowl painter, flower, painter of flowers, sets this goal for herself. She nails it, da 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 da, -da perfect. And then I might say, whether or not this is a very important or, or, or this is very consequential is, is another matter. She, you know, she may be doing something that's, that's um, trite, academic, and no, I guess that's enough, right? <laughs> um, so in, in that way. So, but, but rather than, yeah, and I just, to me, to me that just having two levels makes it a little more interesting. And I've painted them in really extreme brushes and hopefully they, they, it's more nuanced than that. But there's, at least it's, it's not me going in and saying like, you know, in 2012, there can be no chance of a, bowl of flowers being interesting as a painting. To me, that's, that's um, starting with uh, dismissing the, the, uh, the second level sort of dismissal. And uh, I would love to see a, a bowl of flowers uh, that blew my mind. So it's like, and then so it's like, you know, I would, then I would start with like, she makes this knockout bowl of flowers that's more meaningful than, yeah, you know, Romeo and Juliet or something. You know, you can go anywhere.
Wendy must have a question. <laughs> I, I have been waiting a while to ask you this question. I mean, uh -oh. it's something I've been... Well, no, no, time's I, up. I so. have been meaning to do this for a few <laughs> months, or actually, ever since I went to this show in New York. Mm, mm. Maybe it was... Mm. I can't remember if it was this past summer or the summer before or the spring, but it was a huge um, retrospective... or Not retrospective. It was a huge international exhibit of contemporary artists, and it was on an island in the East River. Mm -hmm. We took ferries up to it, and it uh -huh. was an enormous exhibit, mm -hmm. enormous. They built, you know, many buildings mm -hmm. just for this sh exhibit with, like, bathrooms and kitchens, mm -hmm. and they were going to tear it all down, I get it. So obviously, there's a lot of money behind mm -hmm. it, and there were hundreds of galleries. Yeah. So I went. That, that was a fair. Was that a fair? Yeah. So all that was for sale. It was. Or almost all of it. Okay. Yeah. And, and, I, and it was European artists yeah. and you know, American artists yeah. and everything. The cheek by jowl, you know, yeah. rabbit warren of it was, a labyrinth. Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah. It was. And yeah. so I did what you did. I didn't know. I, so I thought, okay, I'm just going to go and see what I see and think what I think. Huh. And I didn't, I mean, that's generally what I do. And mm -hmm. I'm glad to know that that's a, a kind of um, approved approach, mm -hmm. you know. So In some circles. In some <laughs> circles. So I'm going through yeah. and I'm seeing this, that, and the other. And, and I would say that most of the art I saw was very um, spontaneous, kind of improvised looking. Hmm. So like I'd look at a space, like this little green bit of uh, rug here in front of the, the lectern, and someone just like throw wadded balls of paper in it, and hmm. however they landed, that was the art piece, or string dangling from you know hmm. a, a pole or a hmm. light, or I don't know, you know, hmm. broken pieces of glass, or teacups pasted or uh, glued to the wall or uh, just all kinds of mm. interesting mm -hmm. but very um, uh, uh, kind of of the moment like mm -hmm. like it was just spontaneous mm -hmm. and spur of the moment and and I couldn't help but think that I could have done some of it I really did think I could mm -hmm. and um, so I go I, for it I came away <laughs> thinking well and a lot of that stuff yeah. I sort of do do you know in mm -hmm. my house I just like throw mm -hmm. so then I thought what is what am I? What is the moment I'm seeing? What yeah. is this moment in contemporary art? And I'll I'll tell you why I well first just tell me what you think and then yeah. I'll tell you what I came away with. Yeah, um, to me that you were able to um, make any kind of judgment at all at an art fair is pretty remarkable. To me, it's there. It's just chaos. Yeah, I spent and, the whole day. Yeah, and it's, uh -huh. and to me. Uh, People always ask me, like, oh, you're a critic, you're going to go to the fair, right? And I almost always say, no, because it's all it is is commerce. And it's like every single dealer is just like putting up stuff to sell. Now they're kind of finding that um, the, uh, wait, the collage approach or the melange approach or you know, the, the, the Whitman sampler chocolates approach or a little bit of everything isn't as effective as like turning your booth into a little solo show. But to me, very little um, philosophically or aesthetically interesting stuff happens at a fair because it's just like put up on the wall to show yeah. our cool stuff to, to sell it. Yeah. And it really is about um, the, it's aimed at an audience that wants to know which dealers have the coolest shit. And that's, that's the kind of evaluation going on. To me, it's mildly interesting to because the prices are all right there, is to see like, oh, how is this work from the 60s um, priced comparison to a different yeah. decade, but it, to me, there's there's very little work for a critic to do at a fair because the organizing principles are um, it's just yeah. it's a store. But in terms yeah. of what, what I was seeing, yeah. and I've yeah. seen it in galleries too yeah, yeah. in Manhattan and elsewhere, San mm. Francisco, uh, Europe, uh, mm. you know this slacker um, art kind of flung sort yeah. of look to it yeah. what I what what am i what yeah. is that I, I mean i had an idea after yeah. but i, I really yeah. want to hear what uh, you think to me all. there's just right now there's so many galleries and so many shows that you could almost you could find almost anything and make it into that's what's going on now mm -hmm. so to me it's it is actually a moment where just about anything is out there yeah and that you know and the stuff you're describing is a pretty wide strand of what, mm -hmm. how would I characterize it? Um, what? Like post minimal internationalism, ah. where it's like, um, where it's like after uh, minimalism, like making tidy, neat things, and then post minimalism was like kind of making quick, tossed off 
yeah. messes. And uh -huh. now it's like, that's kind of become an international style for art fairs where you, that's the overarching global language. And depending on the region you come from, you toss a few local ingredients in yeah. and like, bang, you have yeah. significance. If yeah. you're from Istanbul, you get the scatter thing with the little Turkish stuff around. Yeah. Or if, you know, if you're from Argentina, you get the scatter thing with the little Argentine stuff uh -huh. tossed in. And it's, it's um, not especially interesting yeah. to me. What was, oh, wait, well, this, yeah. uh, this helps a lot. Yeah. I will say what I came away with. Yeah. A lot of it, I thought, oh my gosh, my study looks like this. It's a yeah. work of art. I mean, I, and then there I, you go. I, and then <laughs> I thought, no well, is shop. it, do you suppose, mm -hmm. are you, I mean, mm -hmm. some of the spaces would be, if I use those as my standards, that, those, those fairs. Um, but, but what I did think was, um, and would this idea hold any water mm -hmm. at all? I came away thinking, well, it changed my way of looking at everything for a little while. So I, like, I look at those chairs and they're all every which way and there are wrinkles in the back. And mm -hmm. if I took a photograph of it, it could be kind of interesting. Maybe mm -hmm. I would move a few of the chairs around a little bit. Um, and it sort of makes me appreciate uh, the texture and the beauty of the moment, whatever my eyes might happen to rest on, mm -hmm. could be called art in a way. You yeah, can yeah. see it a certain yeah. way. And so I came back to my office. In fact, I, I, I flew across the country and I had a meeting and then I went back to my office and I was looking for my name tag because all the you know, official trustee meetings and stuff, you had these, these name tags. And I have a Chinese blue bowl in my office with about 200 name tags from all the Board of Trustees meetings. So I was looking for a particular one I wanted. I'm scared, I kind of messed them up and they were hanging over the edge of the jar. And, the, and I looked at it and I thought, wow, that's I, as beautiful as yeah. anything I saw. Yeah. So then I thought, well, maybe it just makes me appreciate everything more. Mm. Is that a reasonable approach? To me, it's <laughs> not enough. No, no. Yeah, and uh -huh. to me, like, there's a, at, a, at a certain level, um, there's like, oh, anything can be looked at aesthetically. And it's like, yeah, that's absolutely true. But I actually want, I'm like, I've been there and I know that. So for me, that's not new knowledge. To me, it's like, kind of like, no shit, George. Uh -huh. um, and it's, um, and so then I want more from my art, uh -huh. where I still feel like a heel taking that experience away from students or young artists who, who are discovering it. Because at the, at the point of discovery, it's really exciting that yeah, anything. Yeah, there is a certain excitement. Yeah. yeah. And if the art that you've kind of had force fed upon you or crammed down your throat or taught as important, this can be a, a, an incredibly liberating, ground clearing, eye opening, mind blowing sense of possibility. Um, I've had that experience, and I want to build on that possibility, and I want more from my art than just telling me, oh, anything can be art. I'm like, yes, anything can. Now let me see what you did with your art. And, and to me, a lot of the stuff you described, I find tedious and, and dull and kind of like grunge decoration yeah. you know, or slacker oh, decoration. Yeah. So just one more thing. Mm -hmm. What do you mean when you say, I want more from my art? Meaning. Oh. Like, I don't know. Formal rigor. I said formal <laughs> rigor. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, complexity, uh -huh. um, nuance, layered subtlety. I like, uh, um, I have a lot of art in my house. And when I go on vacation and come back, um, so, you know, it's two, three, even a month, two or three weeks or a month later, one of the things I love, love, love most about the art is that I walk in like, oh, that's not how I remembered it. So I want the art to actually change the lazy habits my memory has fallen into. And that's the opposite of like the, 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 cliche, the Marxist cliche is like, oh, collectors want art that just reassures them about their position in society, and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, actually, I want stuff that, that destabilizes my relationship to my world. And I walk in, it's like, I, it's, it is completely different. And I want that you know, over and over and over again. And to me, that's. That's more a measure of the, the, the works, what I would call its complexity or its nuance or its kind of sustained engagement with something that I, I didn't know. But it's got to operate on, on that level. And I, I find it very hard for a, a bowl of name tags to, yeah, to be able to do that to me. Well, I but I also, I don't want it to, if it's like, I'm, you know, I'm not that concerned about taking other people's pleasures away from them. 
it's, it's, it's like if it's like there's if you're you know if, if that floats your boat, float until it wears out. Well, let's let's put it this yeah. way: at least it made going spending the whole day at that yeah. that fair hmm. worth it for a while. I mean, yeah, yeah I don't think yeah. I'd want to look at those name tags for very yeah. long either. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I have just a quick question. Okay. I'm just wondering if you ever step away from the art criticism world and become the artist. No. Never. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> unlike many artists, um, I made work when I was much younger and realized I had no talent and stopped. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I have. I love writing about art. I don't think that's an art. Um, I don't know if it's a craft or a vocation or a, a job. Uh, but I, I re, like I get all my creative jujus out on writing about it, and I'm not compelled to to make it in, in any way, shape, or form. And it's just like there are other writers I love to read who are like you know, also painters who write about art, and they they're fantastic painters and sometimes fantastic writers. But and there are a handful of critics who are failed artists. But I'm I never. Well, you know, had that addiction. I wasn't just never ever. You know, in college I messed around with it, but it was terrible. It was, it was a hell of a lot of fun, but it was. You know, it was like just making Rob Bob Rauschenberg paintings over and over again, which is great when you're in college, and but it, no one needs to look at it. But yeah, I don't. criticism is enough. Criticism is the highest art. Why would I want to debase myself? I'm just wondering you're talking good. about these. You want yeah. more from your art, and I'm just yeah. kind of thinking, wonder if you ever thought, hey, maybe I can give myself this more moment. <laughs> yeah, I'm, no, no, um, I don't have that, that talent or the, the interest. And it, uh, years ago, someone was just indignant that I dared write about something that I didn't also make. Yeah, I was also kind of wondering. Yeah, and I, on the spot, came up with the answer, and I said, well, I'm not writing about making it. I'm writing about looking at it. <laughs> And I can look at it with the best of them. And I actually think there's something to that. That I, you know, I, I do like to talk to the makers, but I'm, you know, to me, ultimately, it's the looking is more important. Thanks. Thank David again. This was very exciting. Thanks.